Aperture. Good evening. Thank you all for joining us today. Of course, especially thank you to Stephen Shaw and Peter Sheldahl for joining us tonight. The, um, I'm Chris Boot. I'm the Executive Director at Aperture Foundation. The cause for this evening uh, is the publication of the new Stephen Shaw survey book. It's produced by the Fundacion Mapfre um, in Spain, alongside their exhibition in Madrid, the first comprehensive survey of your work. Is that right? That is right. Um, uh, and it's on in Madrid until November the 24th, um, if you can get there. We're honored to be the English language publishing, publisher of the survey, which includes 250 photographs from your remarkable career. And this is kind of an announcement and an apology. We have precisely 14 copies available for sale <laughs> tonight. Um, we're still waiting for the shipment from Matt Frey. It's a few advances. Um, so are you going to hold don't go mad. Benefit auction for uh, that's a good <laughs> idea. That's a good idea. Uh, no, we'll just sell them at the regular price. But we will. But we will um, arrange Stephen to come back another time to sign some more copies. So if you can't get your copy tonight, but you'd like a signed copy, um, you can make arrangements at the counter. We're, um, we're also um, unveiling this fall The Open Road, which is a book of which Stephen is a key contributor to. It's the story of the American road and photography, um, written by David Campany um, and uh, focused on the story from Robert Frank to the present. Um, it's, uh, we also have some advanced copies here tonight um, available for sale. We've also taken the theme of the open road for our benefit party this year, and uh, it's a, it, we put a lot of work into creating an event that we all really want to go to, unlike most benefits. Um, we commissioned Alex Soth um, and Billy Bragg and the American folk singer Joe Purdy to travel down the Mississippi together to create a piece for the evening. Um, the Kills are playing with a full band, I just found out, which is rather remarkable. Um, and, um, and very many extraordinary photographers have created work, especially for the occasion, for both the silent and live auctions. That's on October the 21st. Tickets start at 150 bucks. Please come. It's going to be a lot of fun. Um, back to tonight's program. Um, it's, which is supported in part by public funds from the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs in partnership with the City Council and by the board and members of the Aperture Foundation. Stephen Shaw has, has had his first work purchased by, the, uh, by Edward Steichen for the Museum of Modern Art when you were 14, um, at the beginning of your long and illustrious career in photography. You, you were the first living photographer since Alfred Stieglitz, 40 years earlier, to have a solo show at the Met. Um, you have decisively shaped our expectations of photography, and in particular, color photography, and its recognition as an art form, um, including with the book Uncommon Places, um, which we have... Have we maintained it consistently in print since Absolutely. 1982? Um, um, maybe with no, a gap or... the first or edition went out of print. Okay. But since it was enlarged and reissued in 2004. It's been constantly in print. Um, and uh, and a, a book we're tremendously honored to continue to publish. Um, you've had exhibitions uh, at many uh, venues, including the Museum of Modern Art, the Kunsthalle Dusseldorf, the Hammer in Los Angeles, Jeu de Pomme in Paris, and the Art Institute of, in Chicago. Um, and since 1982, you've also been director of the photography program at Bard College. Um, Peter Sheldahl, thank you very much for joining us tonight. Peter has been staff writer at The New Yorker since 1998 and is the magazine's art critic. He came to the magazine from The Village Voice, where he was the art critic from 1990 to 98. And you've also written for The New York Times Arts and Leisure section, Art Forum, Art in America, The New York Times Magazine, Vogue, and Vanity Fair. Your, your, your very long list of writing awards includes a Guggenheim Fellowship, and uh, Peter's the author of four books of criticism, including The Hydrogen, the Hydrogen Duke Box and Let's See, Writings on Art from the New Yorker. A very warm welcome to you both and all of you, and thank you so much for being with us tonight. Thanks, Chris. <laughs> Thank 
So, um, hey, Peter. Hey. <laughs> you know, I'm, the, I'm the word guy, so I'll try, I'll try talking. He's the picture guy over here. Uh, by the way, I noticed there's a big dent in this uh, microphone. Must have been an interesting evening here. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but uh, anyway, I've, I've been trying to, you know, think about what, what to say about, about Stephen's work, uh, and I'll come up with something. But um, uh, in a way, I have, uh, the, the obstacles are two. One is that the, the quality of it is so obvious that it hardly needs to be discussed, and, and so mysterious that it's hard even to start thinking about. Um, and um, I first became aware of it in, uh, as the way a lot of people did in 1975 was uh, the new topographies show and, and book of uh, all these uh, sort of sophisticated and, and uh, somewhat pop or minimalism influenced photographers going out on the road into America and without the, the sort of, you know, the, the romantic um, uh, ecstasy and agony of Robert Frank, um, which was fantastic i mean but and, and remains fantastic but it was it was somebody you know really thrown off you know a european thrown off the deep end um this was uh native sophisticated photographers uh, really looking um and uh you know stephen's work stood out it was in color uh <clears throat> and which was still seemed a little scandalous for reasons i forget um and uh, it was really appealing. I've noticed that, but over the years, you know, although I've, all the other photographers are good and have remained good, you know, they sort of fell back a little bit. And, and Stephen became more and more prominent in my mind and a lot of other people's, so maybe with the addition of uh, Robert Adams. Um, and uh, the quality of that I think, and, and you know, the, the fact that uh, uh, Stephen started it, you know, before the age of 14, um, it's almost like uh, photography was a, a native language. And, um, and I think that's, that's a quality that sets him apart. Um, there are very few other photographers who have it. I mean, it, uh, Walker Evans to an extent, you know, but, but in a very sort of high-toned <coughs> way. Uh, uh, Stephen is is more vernacular, but a master of various tones of voice. Um, well, here I'm going to consult a note I made. Um, um, it's, uh, it's it's a way of speaking uh, of the world from the world. Um, I noticed it, it hit me that the last show at at three o three the, the uh, Ukraine pictures and, and um, um, the ones from Israel, that it's, um, I have a feeling that, that everything that Stephen photographs has been waiting to be photographed for a very long time. You know, it's been sitting there patiently because it can't say anything. Uh, <clears throat> but, uh, you know, I feel like, and, and, that, and that Stephen approaches everything with tremendous respect. And uh, I feel like even a plate of fried eggs with him, you know, has signed a release, you know. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, you know, gladly, you know, sure, sure. Uh, but, you know, as a courtesy. Um, and uh, it's, uh, you know, the, the existence, I mean, it's, if there's a mythic quality, I mean, Robert's, I mean, Stephen is, is a very cool guy, but, you know, and, uh, but uh, if there's a mythic quality or component to his work, and I think there is, it's, it's that the world is full of things that want to be noticed. Uh, people, of course, things, air, air wants to be noticed, you know, and it, uh, and it will suffer in silence if it's not. But um, it's uh, it, it's really like the 
Every photograph of him, uh, of, of Stevens, is a star turn of something. And, um, and as I say, it's, it's, it's steadied and, and made consistent, you know, not, not by any stylistic tricks or motifs or, or formal uh, ruling ideas, but, but by the tone, the tone of voice, the, the, uh, the feeling of respect for things. And um, it's uh, it, what part of you know part of what's been interesting to me about Stephen is that unlike some other photographers I know that how easily he adapted to changing technologies. You know, it was there was no uh, you know uh, piety of uh, archival print. Not that there's anything sinful about that, but. Um, it's uh, it's just because any technology is just a different way, uh, a different tone, a different set of tones for for talking about actuality. Actually, I'm about to say reality, but who knows what that is? Um, you know, that's we can't speak of it because it's it surrounds us. Um, but but there are occasions, and each picture is an occasion, um, and. Um, Anyway, so the uh, I got it. Anyway, so uh, hey, what's up with you? <laughs> <laughs> well, as we're talking, one thing that I kind of focused on was you were talking about a tone of voice, and um, I guess it's been on my mind because it's a very interesting experience to see a retrospective show of your own work. It's, it's one thing to say it's the first time a museum has done it for me, but it's another that it's the first time I've walked into a building and seen work I've done from 1960. A lot of a lot of artists find it traumatizing uh, to be retrospected. Uh -huh. Yeah, I, I I had to think about. Uh, w w there was a press conference and people said, "Well, what do you have to say about this?" And I said, "I just I keep thinking about what happens if you make the cover of Sports Illustrated." <laughs> I don't want this to happen to me. This is, we're going to call this a mid-career retrospective. Let's be clear about this. Um, but one of the things that w I, I felt like I was forced to assimilate was looking at these different phases of my work and, and feeling the presence. Is there something that ties it together, even though I can work in very different directions? Is there some kind of a voice? And I think it, it relates to, to kind of ideas about style. Does style come from inside or is it imposed from outside? And it can be either. And one is called voice and one is stylized. One is called art and one is called artifice. Um, there, there's a building on the Bard campus um, and it's clear that the architect design the facade first. And it's a, it's a well-designed facade, carefully placed windows, it all looks right. And then she added rooms afterward. And there are rooms like a long, thin room that has one window against the wall on the far side. And it's like the, the actual use of the building is an afterthought. And then I think of an architect like uh, Christopher Alexander, you, are you familiar with him? Yeah. Some, very interesting. And he, he designs a building by going on a piece of land and he usually picks the, the worst part of the property because you can, might as well cover it with a building. And think about where do you want to look and I'm going to put a window here and here's where the room is going to go and what room do I want off it. And he's essentially building a house from the, out, from the inside out and trusting his own inner unity that the final result won't be a jumble. Mm -hmm. And that seems to me to be, like, if that's clear, kind of uh, architectural yeah, well, version of is something imposed from the outside or does it grow from the inside? No, it's, it's uh, from the inside. And I think it's, uh, I mean, Oscar Wilde said the style is, is of the individual. Um, <clears throat> and... Um, um, it made me think of, of Frank Gehry. I mean, the uh, 
the Bilbao. That, that's not the building I was referring to at Bard. Huh? I was not referring to the Frank Gehry uh, no, building. No, no, that's a very nice building. But his, the, the Bilbao Guggenheim, I think, is the best building in the world. I mean, it's like, and he took, uh, he took a cliff over a railroad yard on a polluted river, you know, like, like it's, just, it's inconceivable any building would be there. And, and he used it. And uh, um, anyway, I don't know. We can talk about architecture for a long time. <laughs> um, but uh, but there is there is a sense of, of unity. I mean, I think what makes it vernacular is the sense that uh, that everything in your pictures is is continuous with the world. I mean, it's it's uh, it's it's not uh, chopped off. You know, it's framed, but but not chopped off. And and uh, so why are we looking at this? You know, uh, well, because we're here. Where are we? You know, we're, we're here within the view of this, and uh, there's a a kind of very subtle insistence. You know, like uh, you know, if you don't regard this as important, then maybe you should just move on. But uh, but you know, a um, little bit of respect, a little bit of curiosity, and we can communicate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I I think I also have um, a desire to make structural sense of things I see. And I think this is not unique to me. I think this is a human quality, that one, mm -hmm. why we have produced thousands of years of scientists. Yeah. That yeah. Well, there's we, a formality. We, Franco, Franco Harris said, you know, for the, about poetry, that the rhyme and meter stuff only makes sense, you know, when you buy a pair of pants, you want them to be tight enough so everyone will want to go to bed with you. That's just, uh, that's just common sense. Um, but, but also, also just, you know, it, it's, 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 a, it's, it's courtesy, you know, the form is courtesy, you know, it's like, it's like making it less hard, you know, to, uh, to deal with what, what you're dealing with. But if you're not dealing with anything, then it is in fact artifice mm -hmm. and, uh, and to, in some ways fake, which can, of course, be wonderful, uh, but um, <clears throat> um, only on Saturday night. <laughs> so where do, we go, where do we go from here? Oh, no. I'm, I'm, I'm just thinking of Saturday nights past. <laughs> oh, okay. I'm sorry. Is that better? Um, uh, well, well, okay, uh, maybe I have another note. Well, I, I think, and it may be that the two things, whether a voice is, um, comes from the inside or a style is imposed from the outside, and the question of structure may be related, that there's a, a similar thing that can happen where some photographs feel like the structure is generated by what's being photographed. Although it's clearly the photographer that's ordering it, it looks like it's growing from what's in front of the camera. And that may be what you're calling respect. Yeah, well also, I mean, I think is that one of the things is, is that the world is full of things that you don't photograph. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and anything you photograph could be photographed in another way. So oh, it's, um, and, uh, you know, you don't get it picture to picture. You get it, I mean, that's why this book is so incredible, you know, it like, because it, it becomes, um, you know, there, there are some photographers, there are a lot of artists who, you know, one of their works is twice as good as two of their works and three times as good as three of their works um, because they're repetitive, you know. Mm -hmm. That's absolutely not the case with your work. Um, and um, let's see, where was I, where did I mean to go with this? Um, well, anyway, you, you look poised to say something. So, yeah. Well, I mean, that touches on something else I was, uh, the, the show and this book forced me to think about, which is um, that I have almost an aversion to repeating myself. Uh, yeah. it, it's of no interest. So once I figure out how to make a certain picture, mm -hmm. once the problems are solved, 
Well, it's, you know, it's, I mean, it's, the, the, end, the, the, the picture is not why I'm, the photograph is not why I'm making the picture. Mm -hmm. I'm going through the process because, because of a, a need to explore. Well, and, and, and the picture is the byproduct of that process. And also you have a vocation and you're doing your job. And, yep. you know, so, but, uh, but I noticed there's, there's, there's a range which is wide but not infinite in your work between subjects that are interesting enough and not too interesting, you know? I mean, it, occasionally you do a photograph like the looking down on the people in the river, you know, picture, which yeah. is almost too interesting, you know? Yeah, it's, it's like, like I understand. it is a fantastic image, you know, that, uh, you know, you should have published it under a pseudonym, you know, like yeah. Blaze Star or something. I don't know, it's like, you know, because it, 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 it's yeah, funny because, it, because it resembles it resembles a great photograph, which, which, which I think you uh, temperamentally and tastefully avoid. Well, I, I, great can tell, I can tell you a secret, which is that I'm often embarrassed by those pictures. Yeah. That well, I mean, I you mean, know, they, they if it like falls in your lap, shit, you know. Yeah. But exactly. <laughs> I mean, there's this picture I did of a of a billboard with a painting of a mountain on it, and yeah. this incredible sky. Yeah. And I saw it out of the rearview mirror of the car yeah. as I'm driving. And it's like, that's a no-brainer. Yeah. And the yeah. people say, oh, it's a great picture. And I think, no, no, I mean, that, anyone that was who a, was there and saw it yeah. would have taken it. Yeah. That mean, was an understandable <laughs> failure of character. Uh, I, I yeah. understand. Yeah. And, but, but, but as you said, how do you resist it? And yeah. why no, not do it? No. When it's calling out and saying photograph yeah. me, you say, OK. You know, it's like if you, you know, if you hit the deer by accident, you know, might as well take it home and eat it. I don't know. <laughs> um, um, I guess you could uh, no, say uh, that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, uh, no, I don't know. Do you want to uh, open it up to the audience? Some, or, no. No, don't do that. No. Don't do that. Nobody, they're all too shy. You do. Oh, okay. Okay. All right. Well, we heard from you. <laughs> what makes my day? <laughs> breakfast. Um, <laughs> a, a good, br in fact, I live in this little village called Tivoli, and a, a couple of years ago, about two years ago, two Bard students quit school. I think they were juniors, and they quit school to open a little restaurant, and they, and they have fabulous breakfasts. And so, I, many days start the day with a good breakfast, and it makes my day. Uh, well, you're, you're probably you're probably the the photographer laureate of breakfast. I mean, uh, <laughs> it's, 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 well, it, it's almost erotic. I mean, it's almost you almost you almost feel like you shouldn't look, you know, at your pictures of breakfast. Well, uh, Peter Peter had mentioned my interest in or openness to technology and what has been uh, what I've been spending too much time in my life in the past four months doing is Instagram. And I post every day, uh, and think about it a lot, and in fact, studiously avoid food pictures. Uh, I mean, I, I I think I've done maybe in in four months maybe three food pictures that I just couldn't resist, like a really good plate of chicken fried steak in in, in Belgrade, Montana. Yeah, you're getting me excited. Uh, here. I I avoid animal pictures. I I will, I've put in a couple of animal pictures. Um, yeah, about maybe three in, in four months. Um, but I hadn't done a lot of animal pictures before, but I had done a lot of food pictures. So I don't want to, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about the Instagram cliches, and sometimes you want to, in fact, play off them. You know, not, not just avoid them, but use them. Or, or, you know, or if something, you know, is a bug in in your bonnet, just use it up, you know. Yeah. Um, um. But also, also, I think you had the advantage of, of, of being a real photographer before you were uh, damaged by education. Well, I was never damaged by education. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, me, me either, by the way. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, so. I just teach, yeah. And, and so, I mean, I, I didn't, I dropped out of high school. And so when I say to a student, why are you here? Yeah. You know, you don't, you, don't, you really want to, you're not, you're not doing any work and you're 
school, you know, why are you in college? I, you're blowing I'm, your, I'm not just so. Blowing your parents' money, you know. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, I can say it with authority. Yeah. You know, I'm a college dropout, it turns out. <clears throat> no. After after I became a professor, I learned that what I was all along was an autodidact. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's it. Um, I th I had thought of myself as a dropout until then. Uh, then I realized I was an autodidact. It sounds better, doesn't it? Uh, R Richard Benson uh, never went to college, and when he was made the dean of the of the School of Art at Yale, uh, Yale decided they better give him a degree so that. Uh huh. They wouldn't. They wouldn't have a, a dropout dean. Uh, yeah. Well, if you hang around long enough, I think I'll help. You know. But <clears throat> so we're not uh, in a brag of our of our delinquent use. But a little bit of delinquent use is a good idea, I think, uh, for an artist if, if you survive. It, uh, it could be a very good idea. Yeah. Actually, I tell students. I mean, I do a little bit of visiting critic stuff, and I tell art students that if you're in your 20s, um, you need to make mistakes. You need to stay up extra late to make extra mistakes. Because when you get to 30, if you haven't made certain mistakes, you're going to have to make them, and they're going to cost you. But um, I mean, pass that on to your kids. Uh, uh, that's, uh, I think, a very uh, sound philosophy. Yeah. But, but it's, you know, it's, it's like, um, you know, you learn from failure. Success teaches you nothing. You know. Anyway, do you, do you look at Instagram? Huh? Do you look at Instagram? Uh, no. There's some, there's I, some... I don't do any of that shit. Oh, actually, actually, I just, actually, I just, uh, I just wrote a, a blog for the New Yorker about uh, Richard Prince's show of Instagrams, uh, uh -huh. Gagosian, you know, and uh -huh. that, that, that it just, and which was just, Faded. I mean, it was just going to happen, you know, if he didn't, if he snoozed uncharacteristically, some other artist would be noticed that, that uh, Andy Warhol's 15 minutes have been updated to, uh, uh, to urging everybody to be famous 15 times a day. Right? <laughs> and, uh, you know, so it just, you know, you had to scoop it off and, and put it in art. Um, but no, I don't do Facebook or or any of that. I, I had avoided until actually um, in, the, in this very office, uh, the, uh, Leslie Martin uh, said, give it a chance. I mean, really look at this. this well, I don't. I mean, I'd actually, I actually would finally I have some very old person like me friends who have rec recently succumbed to Facebook and really love it. And, and, and so I thought, oh, hell, I'll do it. But then I discovered or I remembered, actually, it happened years ago, that, that some Scottish conceptual artist uh, opened a Facebook account in my name. And, uh, <laughs> you know, and, uh, a, 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 you as know, an, and as I, an art piece? And has since moved on to other things. But, you know, and, and I, tr I tried to get it taken down then, and I don't know how the hell with it. So, <laughs> so now they think I have a Facebook account, and it just seems like too much trouble. So. <laughs> and, um, pity me. Well, I don't know about my global practice because I haven't been, I mean, it, most of the pictures I take are, are bound for Instagram. Um, that's, that's one way to That's pretty global. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm not going to say this is going on forever. It's just, uh, what it makes me think about is the SX-70. And there was something special about an SX-70. Mm that there was a lightness to it, that you could do a, a little, like a notation, you could do a one-liner, uh, a quick observation, and it would be fine. It, you wouldn't need more than that to make a good SX-70. And people recognize that and think, okay, but I'm just left with this little print that I can't reproduce, and mm -hmm. colors are not really that good, so I'm going to try to take the same picture with my Hasselblad. And they take the exact same picture. I don't know why, but the, I mean, exactly the same. And it didn't look the same. I mean, you could put the camera in the exact same location, 
and it would it would always be a Hasselblad picture, not an SX-70. Yeah. It but the SX-70, those, those pictures had a, had a sensuousness to them. It was just really magical. I mean, they were they were things, you know, they were objects. And, uh, well, Instagram is not a thing. It's lost it all sure objectness. <laughs> but it has some of that same quality, mm. that people, that, that lightness, that notational quality. Mm. Um, so that's what I've been... Okay, I'm sold. <laughs> I'm going home. Uh, look, at, uh, look at Peter Halley's account. Peter Halley's, really? Peter Halley has one of the best feeds. Really? Yes. Oh. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> A little plug for him. So, yeah. <laughs> Ma'am? You were saying a little while ago that you take, I'm sorry, that you take a photograph not to have the photograph, but that you want to work out a problem that yes. then results in the photograph. Can you give us an example of a problem you wanted to work out that resulted in a, a photograph? Okay, that's a, that's a great question. Um, first, I'm, I'm going to say a couple of things about that. First, I would say that I think this is this motive is true of most artists that I know that the the work that we know of theirs and we we admire of theirs is not why they're doing it that this is the byproduct of their process um, so a problem there there could be a couple of different problems for example there could be um, I'll, I'll pick one that kind of occupied my uh, occupied me for a, uh, a long time in the in the late 70s which is every now and then I would see a photograph that even though I understand it's just uh, an image on a flat piece of paper had a very tangible illusion of three-dimensional space so I want to understand how is that achieved can this be repeatable and so I try different things think about it structurally. I, um, but there are other, I bet I can tell you a, a, a something that's been in my mind more recently. Um, as Peter said, I've photographed subject matter that was minimally interesting. Not un, uninteresting. Not uninteresting. Not no. uninteresting, but minimally interesting. Mm -hmm. And I've got it in my head two years ago that I wanted to photograph in Ukraine and photograph Holocaust survivors there and understood that I was dealing with a subject matter that was much more politically and emotionally charged than anything I had done before. And so this became an aesthetic problem. How do I photograph these people and the artifacts of their lives and their houses and their towns and do justice to them and communicate something that I f feel is real about them but not rely on the kind of emotional red flags that would automatically go up. So the balance is I could do it, I could avoid the um, emotional the built-in emotional charge, I could avoid the built-in manipulation, emotional manipulation, by doing pictures that were totally cold. But then that wouldn't be achieving my aim. So it's finding a place where, to, for me, something real and emotional is being communicated and cultural that is respectful of them, but is not using them as manipulation. That's, that's, a, that's a fantastic body of work. I mean, and, and, and I think that there is a quality of things wanting to be, to be noticed. It's like, hey, over here, shoot me. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, also, I, I remember looking at it with, with Brooke, with my wife, and, and, and thinking, you know that's exactly what Ukraine is like, and then remembering I've never been anywhere near that place. You know, uh, it's uh, you know I felt I felt that I could smell it. You know that there, there was a, uh, a kind of existential quality, and that uh, and that you know it's it's tragic history, and 
and you were there before its current crisis, but yep. you know, uh, Ukraine has has been a series of crises for hundreds of years, and and uh, in fact, has one of the most tragic histories yeah. of any European country. Yeah, well, that in Poland, you know, mm -hmm. like, uh, oh God, here they come again, you know, <laughs> from one direction or the other. Um, but the the humbleness and the stubbornness and the um, I don't know, and and the beauty. I mean, you were there at a at a gorgeous season. Um, it's it's a it's a beautiful place. I was unprepared for this. It's yeah. But you really you really feel like it's you're letting it tell its story, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, you know, I think one of the things that great artists do at some point in their process is they get out of the way. They turn it over to the subject. What does the work need from me? I'll give it and not expect anything back, you know. And then, mm -hmm. then it doesn't want any more, so it must be over, you know. But and then it's up to up to the world. It's a gift, mm -hmm. and um, you know, and it, it's fascinating. I mean, it's, it's um, you know, it's like if you open you open a lens on the world and the world. Uh, with with your temperament, with your selectivity, you know, with what, with what you don't aren't comfortable with, um, that edits out, and it makes it, you know, because there's one person talking to us, you know, one or one person is being talked through. So uh, um, I don't know. I mean, what a photographer is a selector <laughs> of of the world, and. Uh, and I, I can't think of another who is more fluent, you know, and uh, than you, and uh, you know, and can say big things now and then, but also the small things. Those are the hardest, mm -hmm. the small, sort of fleeting things, you know. That that uh, uh, you know, you have to have a lot of confidence, a lot of practice, and a well, lot of sensitivity. If, if one, one of the things that had been in my mind for years was, as everyone does, one has moments of greater clarity where things look more tactile, more vivid, experience feels more vivid. Mm -hmm. And how do I communicate this with a camera? Mm -hmm. And sometimes photographing the most ordinary things of life better communicates that because that's saying, mm -hmm. I really am giving attention to something. Mm -hmm. You don't have to give attention to something that, that is so dramatic mm -hmm. it knocks you over the head. Mm -hmm. There's no attention required. But if, you, if it's just the totally everyday world, mm -hmm. to make that feel alive means you have to really pay attention. I, wa I wanted to give one other answer to your question. Um, I once had a, a conversation with John Sharkowski about the idea of a, the difference between a photograph and an illustration. And he said, an illustration is a picture whose problems were solved before the picture was made. Yeah, if you couldn't hear the question, it was say something about my shift from 35 millimeter to 8 by 10. And um, it was, as these things go, is actually very matter of fact and, and, and surprisingly simple and uh, practical, which is I, w I did a project called American Surfaces with 35 millimeter. Uh, I was interested in the photographs as cultural objects. They were print, little prints made by Kodak they were, uh, and exhibited as Kodak snapshots as a kind of, uh, to, to kind of draw to the work the cultural associations of a snapshot. But as I got into the project more, I be, became more and more interested in the content of the pictures. And I wanted to continue that and make prints that were not snapshots, and found that the film, the only color negative film available at the time called Kodacolor, uh, was a very unsharp 
film and that if I made an 8 by 10 print, it would look terrible. So I simply needed a larger negative. And I first got a, a crown graphic, like the camera Ouija had. And my idea was to do, there weren't good medium format cameras at the time. I had a Hasselblad, but I didn't want to use a square. And there, if, if the Mamiya 7 were available then, I would, I would have used that and would never have gone to a large format. But um, my idea was to use the crown graphic uh, and just continue American surfaces, but with a 4 by 5 and found that, to my surprise, I really liked working on the tripod and really liked looking at a ground glass. And so I realized if I'm going to do that, then why use a crown graphic when I can use an 8 by 10 Yeah. What one? Uh, so a question about teaching. I'm wondering if... Um, whether you feel that teaching has had any impact on your own work as a photographer, and also whether the experience of teaching uh, yourself is, er, has changed over time. Um, y yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, yes to, oh, okay. Um, changed over time, yeah, because, um, you know, it's not, I teach photography, it's not like I teach 19th century history and I have my notes and 19th century history hasn't changed and I, I can do my class every year. I have to, I'm responding to the students and so as they change, as the culture changes, I have to teach in a different way. Um, I also try different things. I, I, I don't, you know, to, uh, some, I sometimes will some years will not say much at all and will do things like just edit their pictures and see what could be taught without words, just making a selection, taking an edit to try. What I'm after is how do I help them, guide them to finding their, their own voice as an artist. And one way that I've been doing the past couple of years is just is really through editing their work. And it, I think of it as kind of like having a divining rod. And I just look at the picture and, uh, and this one gra I gravitate to. So I pick that and I pick six of them, say, and without thinking about consistency, without thinking about an editorial selection, just saying these are the ones that attract me, what can you learn from seeing these six together? So I'm thinking about how to teach without a lot of verbiage. Sometimes I, I open my mouth and a lot of words come out too. Uh, the other thing I've been trying, I, I don't know if this is of interest to you, but I'll, I'll just tell you anyway. One thing I've, uh, I've been thinking, and this is something Peter and I were just talking about before uh, we got up here. Um, if you were taking a painting class you would actually paint in class. You take a photography class, and, and, and your painting teacher might look over your shoulder and pick up a brush and say, look what happens if you do this. And a photography class, we sit and talk about pictures. And we become very good at talking about pictures. So I've been thinking about how do I, how do I change that? So I have a class where um, it's a, a four by five class, so everyone uses a view camera. And we go out into the field. We go to the city of Hudson, which is about 25 minutes away from the college. I mean, it's a wonderful city. And the class goes out and takes pictures. But because they're, the camera is on a tripod, they can set up a picture, and I can look at the picture and see the picture they've set up, which they couldn't, couldn't do with 35 millimeter without a tripod. I mean, the difference between this and my picking up the camera is the difference in subtlety of framing. But I can look at someone, I can go under their, the dark cloth and look at the picture they've made and discuss it with them and say, well, well, what happens if you take the camera and move it over here? Deciding what to do in art school or with art school, since we're stuck with art schools, is very difficult. Because uh, it seems to me that, you know, that 
if you're going to be an artist, you're probably an artist already, even if you don't quite know it. And being an artist is having an eccentric style of learning, you know, and and like a series of itches to to know this and know that, you know, and it is it is definitely going to run afoul of curricula and syllabuses. Um, you know, I, I think that the, the little teaching I've done, uh, uh, actually it was four years I taught a workshop for studio seniors at Harvard. Uh, talk about, I hated it. Um, but, you know, I thought, you know, I, the only thing I could think to do was to throw red meat through the bars of their cage. You know, it's like, <laughs> I, you know, just stuff I like, stuff that appealed to me, stuff that appealed to people who are respected, you know, and make of it what you will, you know. And and I had a couple classes where there were, I mean, there were very few. I mean, like one out of ten, you know, uh, actually did something and never thanked me, you know, but they didn't have to do that. Uh, but the others thought Jesus is easy, you know, this is an easy class. So Harvard, you know, has the best students in the world because that's what they select for. And uh, you're not going to get artists out of that, you know. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I mean, it's like art school, you know, I mean, the kids in the front row, you know, it's like, you know, the, the professor pleasers, you know. Uh, and then there's the kid in the back row with the hangover and the bad love affair who says nothing. And everybody in the class knows that's the one, you know. And um, the professor doesn't know, you know. It's, it's, uh, it's always a, a gang phenomenon. Anyway, you know, it's a, it's a subject that can keep me going for a long time. <laughs> uh, but also, you know, the talking about art, you know. I talk about art. I'm a pro, you know. And uh, <laughs> I would just as soon artists shut up about it. And I won't, you know grab their brush and uh, tell them what to do, um, you know, and I'm, I accept being secondary, you know, you have art and then you add a word and you have art critic, which comes afterwards, but uh, I do have my pride and, um, you know, and that uh, in general it's like uh, artists, you know, a lot of artists who have things to say about their work, it kind of implies for me that they didn't do their work all that well. Um, yeah. You know, it it should be obvious, um, but of course we live in this absolute word-centric culture, which which confuses uh, verbal ability with intelligence, which is they're not the same thing at all, and um, and so everybody's got to play the talking about the talking about game, you know. And uh, in art school, if you're teaching, you got to get through however many hours of talking in a way that doesn't offend anybody or in the wrong way. I don't know. It's it's kind of crazy. Anyway, excuse well, me. But I, I think, I don't know. I mean, I know that I've gone down some dead ends that I had to discover for myself were dead ends and you know, everything worked out fine. Mm -hmm. But I also know that I, I feel like um, a teacher can guide a student and, well, I and, think and have a sense of which are the paths you want to let them discover are dead ends on their own and which can you well, push one, them? Well, uh, one thing that's been a phenomenon throughout human history and uh, uh, can still be in an art school is, in, in your case, somebody takes your class, they're running up against a master. They're a master. You know, and... Um, uh, and that is very important for in, in, in any field, you know, mm -hmm. art, politics, military, you know, business, you know, of like at a certain point running up against somebody who is really good and established and confident and you're not. I mean, you have no idea how good you are. And uh, it's, a, it's a psychological thing. I mean, you know, it's like, yeah, I'm going to go to Bard and study with Stephen Shore, you know. Um, um, let me put in a plug. They could also study with Anmi Lee and Tim Davis, uh, uh, Gilles well, Perez. So okay. We have, we have a number of, uh, well, yeah. we have well, a number of masters. Yeah, no, it doesn't, I don't know, it doesn't, doesn't have to be somebody from Mount Rushmore. Uh, but, uh, uh, 
you know, and, and also, I don't know, you get different things from, from different people, but it's, uh, it's uh, you know, for somebody who's going to be an artist, it's a matter of testing yourself, you know, and, and uh, uh, let's see, this is, and usually, you know, the, the, the good moments are usually very, can be very slight, you know, uh, uh, you know, I'm not. I know somebody who's quite famous, but uh, who had a was in a situation of being surrounded by uh, pressures and expectations, uh, completely out of his, you know, out of his normal course. And somebody who was his absolute hero was at a party, and he didn't know came up to him and said, "Nobody here knows what you're doing. I know. It's right." That's you know, and and I think in in, the, in anybody's uh, career, there there are there's always going to be that moment, you know, of of uh, of somebody seeing you, being you know, and somebody seeing and and saying that's right, um, or you don't, not and, saying and anything because it's so wrong that you should go into the family business, you know. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I guess that's one of the functions uh, you can perform because people don't come up and say that very much. No, it's it's uh, uh, you know I mean it's, it's uh, I'm sure in this situation it was the the older person just taking pity on this guy you know it's like you know totally talented you know stupidly self doubting and you know let's straighten him out and send him on his way. Um, it's, uh, I don't know, it's such an education. Uh, I, I think, uh, I like to think of the necessary process not as education but as sophistication, which is different. Sophistication is, is knowing what you're going to do with something when you put your hand on it. I mean, you know what it's for, you know, like a sophisticated jet fighter, you know, is is isn't as good as the worst fingernail clippers when you need to clip your fingernails. Does that make any sense? No. No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's you know, education is, you know, you screw off the top of your head and they pour stuff in, you know, and, and then uh you don't know what you're gonna do with it. You know? Uh sophistication is 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 learning it and knowing what you're going to do with it is simultaneous, mm -hmm. you know. And um, well, someone had asked me about um, going to an eight by ten, and mm -hmm. and what I one of the things I found fascinating about using the eight by ten, which was not why I started using it, and was completely unexpected, was it it imposed a discipline, and the discipline came from a couple of things. One is the size of the camera. It becomes something physical. It becomes a tool, not an extension of your eye. You don't see through the camera. But it was something else, which is that it was very expensive. Eight by 10 color is very expensive. And so I couldn't afford to take two pictures of anything. And I knew that if I edited myself by only taking things that I knew were good, I wouldn't take anything good. I would just take safe pictures. So I had to give myself room to take bad pictures or fall on my face. So the economy came from not taking a second picture of anything. And that forced me to decide what I actually wanted. Mm -hmm. And at first that was a struggle because I could see a dozen equally valid pictures that could be made. And then, after doing that for for years, I think it's getting to something that, that's brilliant that, that you're that's, talking that's, about. That's great. That that it became faster and faster until it came to a point where I could I could get out of the, my car and just like, without even thinking, walk to the spot. Like I that like there was a like there was a compass driving me to the pointing me to the spot that I should stand. Mm. But to get to that point, it took years and years of 
of struggling with figuring out what I wanted. Um, I solve it, yes. Um, by, by the way, Stephen, what, what was your first feeling when you were exposed to even the idea of digital photography? The first, a student... But just, just when, you know, when digital started yeah. coming in. Yeah. Uh, and the, the, I, I, a student came to, was in my building mm -hmm. at Bard, and had a camera called uh, a Casio Elixum, which was about the size of a credit card. Mm -hmm. And I thought, gee, 30 years I used an 8 by 10 And here's a camera that you can put in your breast pocket. I'm going for it. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, that's fascinating, because I, yeah, I would think that most anyone who'd been, you know, spent a lot of his life in the dark room would, would, would have a would have trouble with, with that revolution, you know, but not you. No, in fact, now I'm, I mean, aside in the current show that's at 303, there are a group of large landscapes that are 8 by 10, but everything else is digital, mm -hmm. and it's not, I'm going to be serious for a moment, I mean, that was my first reaction, just mm -hmm. the relief of 30 years of an 8 by 10, and <laughs> here's a camera that's... Uh, <laughs> But I use digital now not for convenience, mm -hmm. but because it does some things better than any camera ever has. Mm -hmm. And um, the, the, the high-end ones, the resolution and tonality are so fabulous um, that it's very much like, you know, I, I, you would ask me why I switched from four, a 35 millimeter to a view camera, and it was to get more resolution. And now I can have a camera that's the size of a, of a 35 millimeter SLR that I can make a print, not a huge print, but I can make a print you know, as big as any of those, really anything on that wall, that you'd be very hard pressed to tell from a four by five. Well, I know I was... And, and, and there are other things that it does. In, in low light, it's incredible. Uh, and so it's giving me a picture that I couldn't have gotten before. Oh, there's somebody has had their hand up way in back there a long time. Uh, um, I was just wondering. Oh, yeah. I was just wondering. Um, so you said that you've started photographing with your phone for Instagram. Do you currently still photograph digitally and with your phone? Is there like a separation in your approach? when you go to photograph for Instagram or you're out photographing with your digital camera? And if there is, what's the distinction, et cetera? Um, yes, I'm doing both. Um, there isn't, um, well, here's a distinction. When I'm photographing with my larger camera, I'm thinking of the picture as something that can stand alone. I'm thinking of something that will eventually become a print on a wall. Um, with Instagram, I'm often thinking of works in series. And I, I don't, sometimes I'll do series of 20 pictures, sometimes it'll just be three pictures but they tend to fall into series. Um, and now that's sort of the intelligent answer, and I'll give you the stupid answer, which is when I photograph from Instagram, I, I take square pictures. Uh, I mean, I know that I can post oblong pictures, but Instagram, I, I like to accept its language, its terms, and its terms are the pictures look better square. And I've never taken square pictures before and it requires something different. Also, if I'm using an 8x10 or a high-end digital camera, I can pay attention to little things in a picture that I don't have to focus on. I, I can allow them to be little points of interest in a larger field. 
Um, where with 35 millimeter, I might want to walk up to something and make a point of showing this. With an 8x10 or a high-end digital, I can let it be small in the picture and have a number of these points of interest. I don't do that with Instagram because I know the final size isn't going to be 24 by 30. It's going to be, you know, 3 by 3. And so I'm thinking about what makes sense in that size. Okay. No, if, if it, let, finish your question. Did everyone hear the question? Okay. Um, it, it, before Instagram, um, I might have taken my digital camera around. Uh, but I, I tend to have like two methods of working. When I'm using, when I'm going out being a photographer, I like to do it all day long and put aside a long period of time, or even a short period of time, of, you know, a couple of weeks maybe. But when I'm working for a couple of weeks, I get up first thing in the morning and I'm out and I photograph all day long. Um, it's like a nine to five job. Um, Instagram is really more what you said, that, I, that I'll, I'll notice something, you know, and I may, I may do a series all at once and then post it over several days. So yesterday I was taking my dogs on a walk in the meadow behind my house and, and the light was fabulous on a, a clump of trees and I did a series of pictures of it and that'll take care of my feed for a few days. I have to feed. I have to feed the feed exactly. Uh, maybe over here. Right? So I, just I and I'll say something else, which is really stupid. Um, I've developed Instagram friends, and um, just made a trip to Europe and had uh, lunch in Amsterdam with uh, an Instagram friend, and then. Uh, Two people whose feeds I started following in 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 England. Uh, I was in London and uh, we had tea together. Uh, I, I, my wife and I are in the process of getting a small cabin in Montana, which is a place we used to live in, and a place we love and we love to go fishing. And. The, the cabin is, I mean, the place we got was an incredible piece of land, but the house is just totally a piece of shit. It, w it was built really cheaply in 1969 and has never been improved, and it's, it's just terrible. And so we've been thinking about what to do with it and then realized that there was an architect in Switzerland who's been following me and following my wife on Instagram. And I looked at his website and he took this broken down barn in the Alps and renovated it and, it, and it's this wonderful little little chalet, but I mean small, surrounded by mountains, just the way our place in Montana is. So I, I wrote to him and said, you know, you don't know me from Adam, but I, I, mean, I guess you do know me because you're following me on Instagram. <laughs> do you want to trade uh, your time for some photographs? And he said, sure, in, in two weeks he's coming, he's flying from Geneva to Montana. I'm going to burst into tears. <laughs> <laughs> there was somebody here? So I have one question about the, the 70s pictures. So when, whenever I see them, they're beautiful and they feel perfect, their own stories, but I also feel sometimes like they fit together as a narrative. And I was wondering when you were doing them, were you thinking about them thematically as a story or were you just taking isolated experiences, photographs? Did it come to, did it, 
or did mm -hmm. that ha did anything happen over time where you were thinking about them as a collection? Because I collect and have never bought anything of yours. It's expensive, but I would think that if I bought them, I would actually want more than one, and partially because I uh, think absolutely it, should have more than one. <laughs> But I think yeah, about it it's partially because I, they feel a little bit, they almost feel like they don't belong as individual photographs sometimes. And maybe that's just because I've seen them in, in the collection. You're, you're talking about the 70s yeah. at once? Yeah. yeah. Well, there is, a, there is a kind of cinematic unity to those. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's almost like it is well, a road movie. Yeah. I, I, didn't, I didn't think of them in a series in the way you're describing it, where the, seri the group American Surfaces, when I was photographing, I already had that title in my head. On Common Places, it was titled several years after all the pictures were taken. But American Surfaces, I had that title. I, th I thought of it as a very specific kind of s diaristic series. Um, but I understand what you're saying about a connection because as I described before, when I'm working, I mean, that, those pictures, I'm out for two, three months at a time, photographing every day, all day long, and I have things I'm working on, things I'm thinking about. And there may be a, a period of time where I'm looking at a particular spatial issue that I need an intersection to deal with, and that a plate of food isn't going to do it. I need an intersection as the raw material. And so I could go for a couple of days, and I'm just photographing intersections over and over again. There could all, there's also there's the consistency or the continuity of things on my mind as I'm working. There's also what Peter was talking about at the beginning tonight about a, a quality of a voice. And you know, I'm the same person, so they're going to tie together. But I wasn't really thinking of them as a series. Let me add one other thing. I don't think that body of work is, I think you're right that seeing one doesn't do it, you need to see a bunch. But I don't think that's unique for that body of work of mine. I think that's u true of almost any photographer I can think of. Yeah. That, you know, there, there's a trend now more and more toward group shows that have almost a room for each photographer. And one of the first people to, to do that was a German curator, Thomas Vesky, who did a show in, in uh, Hanover, um, w where it was essentially like 16 one-man shows or one-woman shows together. And then he, he um, went on to do a show called Cruel and Tender at the Tate Modern, which was the same thing. And now, uh, uh, I just came from London where there's a show at the Barbican where a dozen photographers each has a, a, a room and there's going to be a show at the Tate Modern that I'm going to be in uh, um, in November where it's the same thing. And I think of that as in, in comparison to the old group show where everyone has one picture. And this way you get so much more understanding of what the photographer is thinking about. Yes, it is called constructing but worlds. Think, but I think that you know that I mean every picture of yours is a picture of yours, and there is a a kind of fractal quality. I mean, that in a way, every picture contains all the others. Um, and uh, and I think, by the way, those '70s things. I think any one of them, you know, is replete with with the others. I mean, and, I think, and let me say that. If you can't afford to buy three of them, buying one is still, <laughs> is still a satisfying experience yeah. for, for both of us. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. Um, Ma'am, yeah, right here. Yeah. You with a hand up. Yeah. So, Stephen, how have you um, archived your old photographs and negatives? because color photographs and negatives do fade. And also, have you taken any of the old negatives and reprinted them? And has the quality changed? Um, I've kept my negatives in a refrigerator since they were made. And that 
the, the best storage conditions for negatives are 35 degrees, 35 percent humidity, uh, which is can be accomplished by a Sears refrigerator. In fact, the be the better refrigerators are no good for negatives. Like sub zero are very humid because it's better for vegetables, but bad bad for for film. So that's how I've stored them. But even then, we're talking 40 years, and there's color shift. And um, this year, I've been going through a large pro project of uh, scanning, and uh, scanned probably 600 negatives this year, and and and, and printed them. Um, and so, it, to answer your question, yes, they, I've, I've been. S saving them and printing them. Yeah. Yeah. Wait, wait, wait for the microphone. Although it sounds like you do have a good <laughs> resonant voice. And when you're working on a project, a book, or something, uh, how do you know when you're finished? How do you know when the vision is completed and you don't need just one more? Uh, that's a great question. And it's a very hard one to answer. Um, which is why I'm having a hard time <laughs> answering it. <laughs> There's a, a sense I have when I feel I'm beginning to repeat myself. There's a certain feeling where, like, I can take the picture and it's, it's just fine. In fact, it could be more perfect in certain ways but I'm more interested in the flawed ones, that I'm grappling with something. And the, there's just a certain feeling I recognize that, you know, I've done this. Um, when I, I did the work in Ukraine, I w was there for a trip. I took a lot of pictures. I got a, I, it was a question of, do I have enough pictures for a book? Yes, I had plenty, enough pictures for a book, but there was, something on my mind that I felt like if I went having experienced what I experienced and now having seen the pictures, if I went back one more time, I could just finish it off in a certain way. And so I went back again about a year and a quarter later. But when I came back from then, I felt like it's done. It, it, I wish I could come up with something more, uh, more precise, but it really is, is a kind of feeling that, that um, what I had in my mind is, was, has been resolved, and that if I go back again, I'm begin I, would, I would just be repeating myself. Well, it, it was a different time for me. And so I described before this process of using a view camera and trying to figure out which, what is the picture I want. And so I would take, you know, sometimes six pictures in a day, maybe in a really good day, 12 pictures. Um, and, and that went on for a, a long time. And so th those years, it was, it was a, a different phase in my learning where I was just working out some basic perceptual problems with photography and working out the kind of nuances of my relationship to the content and, and figuring out what I wanted a picture to be. Um, and so that kept the work, I would say, fresh. Um, as it got easier, as I described uh, being gravitating to a spot. Well, what happened is that I could take more pictures in a day. And one of the things I found exciting for me about digital is that I found that with the 8x10, I was being limited by the physical qualities of the camera. And I would see pictures around me, many pictures around me, that I just didn't have time to take. 
And when I work with the digital, I find I work the exact same way as I did with the 8x10, that after 30 years of only taking one picture of something, I don't see a need to take a second picture with the digital, unless what I'm photographing is changing. If I'm photographing people on the street, a portrait, I'll take more than one picture. But if I'm photographing a building, if I'm photographing, dare I say it, a plate of food, I'll, I'll, with the digital, I'll take one picture. Like all those pictures you saw in, in, of the Ukraine, aside from one portrait of, a, of a, a couple of portraits that were in the show, I'm taking one picture. And if I do that, I can take, I can't tell you how many pictures I can take in a day. I mean, it's just... Well, actually, that, that's interesting. I didn't know that. And it does rhyme with my experience. I mean, there, there's a freshness. There is a kind of, you know, uh, first time kind of feeling to, to the pictures that, uh, as opposed to, you know, someone who obviously has, has filled up contact sheets and, you know, and and selected, where, where in a way the uh, the quality of a lot of photographers is, is really more about editing than, than photographing. But uh, um, anyway. Um, is the 303 ship still up? Yes, it'll be up till November 1st. November 1st. Um, thank you both so much um, for, for this tonight.